Who do you think prepared the Last Supper? Look. Brad, it's easy enough. It's flour, water, a little salt, herbs if you want more flavor. Normally, you'd add yeast, but not at Passover. No, at Passover, we cannot wait for the bread to rise. Our deliverance from Pharaoh is at hand. So the story goes. Passover is always the same. We eat the bread, we drink the wine, there's lamb, bitter herbs. We remember our deliverance and our coming deliverance. Next year in Jerusalem, we always say, Messiah will come. It's always the same. But sometimes it, it seems so far away, so complicated. But this year, things were, well. Two men followed our servant home from fetching water. They were wanting a place to celebrate Passover with their rabbi, and my husband and I, we had an extra room. So I baked the unleavened bread, and I delivered it when they arrived. The rabbi graciously introduced himself, and a horde of 12 men followed him into our upper room. I'd heard about this rabbi. Wild tales of healing blind men, raising the dead, and walking on water. So, naturally, I stood outside the, the door and I peeked around the corner. And that is when he turned it all upside down. You see, the person who sits at the head of the table isn't supposed to get up and wash other people's feet. But this rabbi, he was moving from man to man, washing each of their dirty feet. Well, I pulled back before I was seen, but still, I listened. I stayed and listened. His words were sure, kind, but, but like fire, like no rabbi I'd ever heard. If you see me, then you see the Father, he said. He also said that he would be broken for them. He talked of the new covenant and being children rather than orphans. And as the bread was passed, the unleavened bread of deliverance, he said, I am the living bread. Living bread. What could we have understood about that at the time? A new covenant was coming, and our deliverance was at our doorstep. Little did we know that our entire world was about to be turned upside down. Good morning. It's good to be here, isn't it? It is good to be able to sing, except I think I've um, overdone it and I just drank the rest of your water, Feel Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> hopefully it will be all right. Well, today we're kind of thinking about that middle time between Palm Sunday and Good Friday. And um, Phil kind of introduced and reminded us what Palm Sunday was all about. And now we're fast forwarding a little bit to, to that meal, that last supper. So, we're going to have a look at some significant meals, two significant meals in the Bible today. And I wonder whether you've ever had a significant meal. What, what comes to mind when you think of a significant meal? I mean, people all over the world, regardless of culture and religion, have meals together to celebrate, to acknowledge. 
Some of you I know have regular family dinners and they're, they're significant times. Many of those meals are on a Sunday. Um, maybe you think about your wedding when you think about a significant meal. Often when I think about some significant meals, I think about our travel experiences and um, times where as a family we've experienced something or introduced the kids to um, a new food of some kind which they didn't want to have and then they loved and that's a victory for parents, you know, when that happens occasionally. Um, I was thinking, when I was thinking about travel, I then got a bit sidetracked in my mind about a real significant meal that Phil and I had and we were in New York with our whole family and my mum and my dad and Phil's sister. And we'd had a big day one night and everyone was tired and, um, and Phil and I had had in the back of our mind that we wanted an opportunity one night to duck out to this cute little ramen bar which was like opposite where we were staying and every night there was this big lineup outside, um, you know, a long lineup outside and we'd wanted to go there but it was like literally like a little, in a little bar like under, you know, sort of underneath the main street kind of thing and it was tiny and our kids were much smaller then. It was about six years ago and um, so we did what all good parents did and we went to 7-Eleven for dinner and got hot dogs um, for our whole family and then went back, put them to bed my mum and dad stayed there too, it's okay. And then Phil and I ducked out and we lined up for about an hour, hour and a half um, and this night in New York opposite where we were staying in this beautiful apartment and we, we had this ramen squished up in the corner, like the bar seats in the tiny corner and it was the best ramen we've ever had. Um, I went back a few years later with a friend of mine, Suzanne, um, who's not a ramen fan. She went and got chicken and chips from Chick-fil-A and um, it was raining and snowy so there was no weight and I went down and experienced a meal but it's not the same as when you experience with people that you love and that was a pretty cool adventure wasn't it hun? Yeah. Anyway, significant meals, that's a little bit of an aside, but maybe you can think of a sig significant meal. Maybe for some of you new mums, it was that first meal that you got to have, you know, those beautiful soft cheeses and meats after you gave birth. Maybe that was significant. But we're going to look at two significant meals in the Bible, very different meals, but very significant meals. And sometimes the smallest details in familiar Bible stories can be really impacting when we consider them in a, in a fresh perspective. And this is what happened to me a few weeks ago when I was reading these stories again. Something significant from the first recorded meal in the Bible to me seemed to echo to this meal, Jesus' last meal with his disciples on earth in this upper room in Jerusalem. And so we're gonna, I'm going to ref reframe the meals a little bit and show you some significance in it and hopefully you'll get a little bit more insight into this understanding of an upside down Easter that we're considering this year. So the first meal is the account which follows God's creation of humankind after providing the perfect place for them, not only to inhabit, but to enjoy, to live, to occupy. The Garden of Eden, this home that God created for Adam and Eve. It's described in Genesis 1-2, and we're not going to read that today. But the next chapter, known as the four in chapter 3, is where this first meal was situated, and it's where the curse of death begins. Look at me with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter 3. It's going to come on the screen as well, verses 1 to 7. And notice some of the wording regarding this first recorded meal in the Bible. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the tree, fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise... She took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Adam and Eve fell for a lie. They were deceived. They, they wanted to be like God more than they wanted to trust God at his word. They ate of the fruit because they wanted to be like God more than they wanted to trust what God had said. In the previous chapter, God had made it really clear what would happen if they ate from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden, 
But the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So this serpent started his bidding, sowing doubt into the heart and mind of Eve. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden or you will die? Take take note of that detail though, that first meal. They took and ate. And as a result of the taking and the eating, that which was forbidden, their eyes were open. They realized they were naked. They fashioned coverings to try and hide their shame. In an attempt to be like God, they suddenly realized they were not. They were flawed. Perfection was turned upside down because they took and ate a meal they'd been told not to. They took and they ate. So fast forward now to this New Testament. And it's interesting that all the gospel writers, this doesn't happen with very many stories, but all the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and even Paul later on in Corinthians, talks about this significant meal, this last supper that Jesus enjoyed with his friends, his disciples. This significant meal um, commemorated the faithfulness of God to the people of Israel that tied back thousands of years to the Passover and the exodus from the Egyptian slavery. So Passover was just around the corner and the meal marked the beginning of an eight-day celebration. But preparations for this meal, as we saw, began well in advance. For weeks, Jews from all over Israel, all across the empire, ascended to the holy city to find lodging and prepare for this most significant meal of the year. And Palm Sunday commemorates Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem for this Passover celebration. That's why so many people were descending upon Jerusalem. As Jesus had instructed, the disciples selected a sacrificial lamb and then located a secluded private room on the second floor of Mara's home. In keeping with the Jewish law, they began purging the room of any trace of leaven or yeast, two days before the Passover, which on this particular year began at sundown on the Thursday. And by midday that day, all work came to an end as a representative of each family would get the sacrificial lamb and they would take it. They would take it to the temple, carry it over its shoulder. And about 3 p.m., a Levite blew the ram's horn. And at that time, worshippers filled the court. This was their act of worship to their God who was their saviour, their rescuer. And the massive gates would close behind the men. And each worshipper killed his own lamb, skinned it, and drained the blood into a basin. That was their act of worship. Don't we have it easy? I complain when the air conditioning's not on high enough. (laughs) This sounds brutal and frankly pretty gross to me. You know, that 21st century um, person who buys their meat very prepackaged from Woolworths, you know, little blood as possible. But actually, this was how every meal began in the first century. But on Passover, the lamb began, had this special significance and so it was killed in the temple, in the, temple, in, the, in the courtyard of the temple. The blood was drained into a basin, as I said, held by a priest who then splashed it against the base of the altar, for, altar to signify the atonement of sins. The fat and the kidneys were surrendered for burning on the altar as part of the peace offering to their God to signify friendship between God and the worshipper. And then when the sacrifice was complete, the the worshipper, the representative of the household would take the lamb, put it back over his shoulder and take it home and roast it in preparation for this dinner. In keeping with the instructions given for the first Passover, the disciples would have smeared blood on the doorposts of the main entrance and prepared the other elements of the ritual meal, the bitter herbs, the unleavened bread, the wine. And so Thursday evening, just before sundown, Jesus and his disciples arrive in their festive white tunics. And as they entered the room, a servant should have been available to them to help them loosen their sandals and and wash their feet and rinse them. But on this particular night, they were alone. And we heard Faye read to us early that Jesus settled into the honoured place reserved for him at the head of the table. He lit a ceremonial lamp to signify the end of the work and the beginning of the celebration for that that festival. He filled a cup of wine and he gave thanks to his father for the faithfulness to Israel and then dedicated the evening, as all Jews would have done, to remembering the exodus. As each man drained his cup and then, and then reached for a bowl of water for the first ceremonial washing of hands, Jesus stood up 
And Faye read to us earlier, this is just a few verses. Jesus rose from the table. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. And then he says, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done for you. When Adam and Eve at their first meal desired to be like God, Jesus demonstrated what God in the flesh truly looked like. Adam and Eve were grabbing, wanting to be like God, disobeying God in order to be like him. And Jesus says, no, if you want to be like me, you take off the towel and you wash one another's feet. Adam and Eve took and ate and their eyes were open and they realized they were naked. They were, they were trying to take steps to ascend into greatness. They were trying to better themselves. They were trying to be like God. Just as the disciples had been, if you remember, not too much before this, when, when they were arguing about who would sit on the right and the left-hand side of God, who was the greatest? But Jesus, he demonstrates what servant leadership and the love of God look like. He took the descending steps into greatness. And he redefined for them what God was like. He washed their stinky, dirty feet, just as a servant would have done. He demonstrated what it was to love to the humblest level imaginable. And this is the kind of love that turns things upside down, even today, right? This is what Jesus, the Son of Man, came to do. It says in Mark 10, 44, they didn't really understand fully what he meant when he said it. He said, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus' whole being, but also especially in this moment, this meal of significance, he redefines everything of importance and they couldn't really fully understand it. While Jesus' actions of servant leadership and, and love with the foot washing would certainly eternally change the disciples, the Last Supper would also point to the cross and the real Passover, pointing to Jesus as the Messiah who came to rescue those who were under the curse of sin and death. Jesus was at the centre of it all. And Jesus gave new meaning to an old remembrance of God's faithfulness. And he was one that could turn a phrase like no other. Have a look in Matthew how he records this gospel account of this meal. He says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread. After blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body. And he took a cup for which he had given thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus is reversing that curse that began right in that first meal in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, when Adam and Eve took and ate. At the Last Supper, Jesus says, Take and eat. I've made everything right. Everything in the world has been upturned upside down. Sin and death has, has, brought, has brought hatred and has brought shame, misplaced trust right from that first meal. But Jesus says, I've come. The breaking of bread symbolizes the breaking of my body for you on the cross and the pouring out of my blood for the forgiveness of sins. What Jesus was about to do on the cross really symbolized throughout the meal the fact that it pointed back to himself. He was about to cover us from our shame, our nakedness, if you like. Genesis 3.21 said, The Lord God made for Adam and wife garments of skin, sorry, garments of skins and clothed them. They took and ate to be like God and God provided for them. And here the disciples are. They don't understand, but they do realize deep down that only God can cover the type of suffering that they're feeling. A sacrifice of an innocent animal's life took place and the covering of animal skins was used for Adam and Eve, but Jesus was about to do the same on the cross. His body broken for us. His blood poured out for us and for all who called on his name. 
You know, only God can deal with the guilt and shame that results from the pain we've experienced because of sin. Only God can provide for that. And when Jesus says, take and eat, that echoes on for eternity. And on Friday, as we gather this Friday, we will remember, we will symbolically take and eat. But as we sit today in this moment, as we sit this week in this moment between the beginning of Passover, the the celebration of a king, and when we know all that he has done and will do for us, I invite you this week to reflect on his humility, his servant leadership, the fact that God gave up the rights of God to serve and to enable us to take and eat, to be provided for, so that indeed we may start to become a little bit more like God when we do that for others. May we with every meal, every action, every word, acknowledge God as our king and our fellow humanity as people worth serving, just as Jesus in that meal served Judas and Peter. We're going to spend a few moments reflecting with the help of a song and Louise and Joe are going to help us. And this song called Hosanna says, I see the King of glory coming on the clouds with fire. The whole earth shakes. I see his love and mercy washing over all our sin. The people sing. These two images are the ones that we've been presented with today, right? The King of glory coming on the clouds with fire. The whole earth shakes. Everyone's in awe of all that God has done. But maybe today we need to take that on a little bit personally as well. I see his love and mercy washing over all my sin. The Passover meal was just that, his love and mercy for those whom he loved there in the room, those who let him down, those who weren't perfect. And today, maybe we here in this room, maybe you at home in your room, need to be reminded of his love and mercy and all that he has done for you. This morning, if you are in the room, you might want to come and kneel and and thank God for that gift. You might like to ask God to help you to show the same love to others. You might need to claim that greatness of God this morning for whatever situation you're, 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 you're facing. Claim Him as King of that in your life. Let's have a few moments to reflect and you can sing along if you like, but we're going to be helped as Val sings with us now.